Well, good evening again, everyone, and welcome back to our series on food and fellowship. Tonight it's food and fellowship in memory of Christ. A certain gospel says that when Jesus was 12 years old, he went to, uh, with his parents to Jerusalem for Passover. Once the feast ended, Jesus' parents departed for home, but unknown to them, he stayed in Jerusalem. Well, after much searching, they found Jesus in the temple with the Jewish teachers, who, as this gospel goes on to say, were all attending to him and wondering that he, being a child, was shutting the mouths of the elders and teachers of the people, explaining the main points of the law and the parables of the prophets. Next, we read that the scribes and Pharisees then asked Mary, are you the mother of this child? And she said, I am. And they said to her, Blessed are you among women, for God has blessed the fruit of your womb. For such glory and such virtue and wisdom we have never seen or heard. And Jesus rose up and followed his mother and was subject to his parents. Well, depending on how well versed you are in the New Testament Gospels, this passage may sound familiar. You might recall the story from Luke chapter 2, but maybe then wonder if that was exactly how you remembered it. You might realize then that it is out of a very different gospel than those in our New Testament. It appears in the so-called Gospel of Thomas, one of the apocryphal gospels, which is a collection of early Christian writings purporting to relate the deeds and revelations of Christ. There are many apocryphal writings modeled on the gospels, the Acts of the Apostles, the Epistles, and the Book of Revelations, as well as on Old Testament wisdom literature. All the New Testament Apocrypha are what is called pseudepigraphal. Always difficult for me to pronounce correctly. Pseudepigraphal, meaning spurious writing ostensibly written by some biblical figure. Most of these arose from Christian sects that came to be declared heretical, while others were arguments against various heresies, and some were attempts to publicize and popularize the life of some saint or church leader. All seem to have been written to win support from Christians for various church factions that were vying for the ascendancy in those early days in uh, the history of Christianity. Few of the writings bear a close resemblance to our canonical New Testament, but they do include statements and phrases copied from it and combined or rearranged to describe incidents and doctrines either invented by the Christian authors themselves or already legend by the time they recorded them. But the apocryphal New Testament is only part of the many writings from early church history which have had an effect on people's concepts of Christianity and of their concept of Christ himself, as well as the beliefs and practices associated with him. Which is one reason we have spent some time now on going through the combined texts of the Last Supper in an attempt to see the historical event as it was uh, correctly recorded without the uh, perspective of later traditions. All four accounts of the Last Supper record some of what Jesus said after he broke bread and after he gave the cup. Matthew and Mark's near identical accounts about the bread record Jesus as saying to the disciples, Take, eat, this is my body. Luke's slightly lengthier account covers everything Matthew and Mark cover, but he also records Jesus as saying that his body is given for you. And Paul's record at 1 Corinthians 11 verse 24 is essentially the same as Luke's. As noted in the last talk, everything Jesus said concerning the cup is covered by Matthew and Luke combined, but it is instead Mark's account which makes it clear that the disciples all drank of the cup before Jesus actually told them it is his blood of the new covenant. This shows that Jesus had no problem letting them drink before they knew the wine's significance and agrees with Jesus' custom of sharing table fellowship without making specialist knowledge a necessary prerequisite. And while there is not the same clarity on this point in the case of the bread which Jesus broke, Luke's and Paul's remark that the cup was given in like manner as the bread could mean the disciples began eating it prior to Jesus telling them that it is his body. The combined accounts do allow 
for this scenario. We now focus on Luke and Paul's records again because they alone quote the words of Jesus which make the Last Supper of more than just academic interest. Jesus told his disciples to do this in remembrance of me. He said it after he broke bread as Luke 22 verse 19 and 1 Corinthians 11 verse 24 inform us. And he said it again after the wine was drunk, as Paul indicates at 1 Corinthians 11 verse 25, after, where he quotes Jesus as saying, Do this as often as you drink in remembrance of me. For all Christians, it is this instruction to remember that gives practical relevance to the Last Supper accounts. With these words, Christ formally appointed table fellowship to be a core practice by which his disciples should remember him. Some go so far as to say he inaugurated a new institution, but this is not strictly true, for as we have seen in this series, fellowship around food was an appointment of God ever since the Garden of Eden, and was one that Jesus already observed in principle and in practice throughout his ministry. The fact that commensality is not specific or peculiar to Jesus, but a universal human practice may be a reason it is not named as a doctrine of Christ at Hebrews 6 verse 1. A number of Christian writers query whether Christ's choice of table fellowship in remembrance of himself is best regarded as a request, an exhortation, an instruction, or an injunction. Yet the Lord's words are unlikely to have been uttered or recorded that had, had they not been important and serious to him. And they are clearly um, imperative, which should mean taking heed to them is obligatory or mandatory for his followers. Several denominations call his appointed table fellowship an ordinance, meaning an authoritative direction or decree. Many Christians see it as one of his commandments of Matthew 28 verse 20, which were to be taught to all nations an observance of which is essential if one is to be Christ's friend on his terms, as he said at John 15 verse 14. Delivered as it was to be obeyed into the future, this command is an important reason the Last Supper was left on record in the inspired New Testament, so that successive generations of Christians could know the true import of the command as related in Christ's own words and context, rather than by later traditions. That Jesus gave his command twice that evening, and in two slightly different formats, the bread and the wine, this suggests it was a God-given word and firmly established, rather like Joseph's and Pharaoh's dreams. And in this way, Jesus emphasized how imperative and how irrevocable it was to be. The words do and remembrance are active verbs, they indicate action or performance, both in the doing and in the remembrance itself, which in Greek actually has the idea of actively recalling or bringing to mind. In his two words, do and remembrance, Jesus expressed his will and expectation that the outcome of their table fellowship together that evening in the upper room would be his disciples' continual involvement in the same sort of practical activity. About a quarter of a century after Christ first spoke the command, his words were cited by Paul to Gentile Christians living in Corinth over a thousand kilometers from Judea. The command was also cited some years later again in Luke chapter 22 for a readership in Rome almost twice as far from Judea as Corinth was or is. These references prove that Paul and Luke both understood that when Jesus said, do this in remembrance of me, he said it not only for the apostles, not only for the um, uh, Christians of Israel or Judea, but for every disciple, including those who would arise in future generations or from the far reaches of the earth. Everything else said at the supper and all the other things that happened there might have exercised the minds of the apostles to their dying day, and they might have become subjects of intellectual study for historians or theologians through the ages. But Christ's command 
directed, even demanded, all his New Testament followers to imitate his behavior and practice of table fellowship at the Last Supper. So it is this command then that gives the text concerning the bread and cup its importance and relevance to Christians of every nation and culture uh, at any time. Only the words, do this in remembrance of me, really advance the Last Supper narrative from being a consideration of historical events to being an illustrated instruction to Christ's disciples down through the ages. When Jesus said, do this, his words related, of course, to the scenes in which the breaking of the bread and the giving of the cup took place. And the question arises, what makes those scenes sufficiently distinctive or exceptional that Jesus chose them as the means of his remembrance? Was it something to do simply with eating and drinking? This seems logical, if not patently obvious, as eating and drinking is what they were doing when he had told them to do this. For all that, it should be just as logical and obvious that as far as consumption of food and drink goes, the disciples' experience each time Jesus said, do this, was actually indistinguishable from the rest of the meal. If the words were taken as his instruction simply to eat and drink, then the disciples had no reason other than to think he meant them to dine as they were doing at the supper and as they had done at countless other meals. It is obvious that when Jesus said, do this, he meant the eating of bread and drinking of wine, for these were the food and drink referred to. And yet again, it should be just as obvious that the particular loaf Jesus broke and the particular draft of wine he dispensed were in themselves no different to any other bread and wine consumed that evening. At the time Jesus said, do this, the bread and wine under consideration were the same staple food and drink that they had been during the meal, and the partaking of them could not have been differentiated in any noticeable way from the eating of bread and drinking of wine earlier on. Again, the disciples had no reason to think he did not mean uh, eating all the bread and all the wine. It is clearly stated that Jesus blessed the bread or blessed God and gave thanks for the bread as he did for the wine. It may seem as if this bestowed or invested a special, even unique, sanctity on the particular bread and wine that he gave the apostles. Perhaps then any future bread and wine consumed in obedience to Christ's command must also be of an exceptionally sanctified kind. Yet if so, then once again the same must apply to the rest of the supper for Jesus had already asserted its sacred God-given character from the outset in Luke chapter 22. First by equating it to the Passover at verse 15, second by alluding to it as a type or foretaste of his future kingdom banquet at verse 16, and third by giving thanks for the cup from the start of the very first serving at verse 17. Or could the cup partaken of early on in the supper have been somehow less sanctified in Christ's hands than the cup after supper at verse 20? I think not. What actually distinguished the two events at which Jesus said do this is that on each occasion he very conspicuously and all voluntarily served his fellow diners, standing up from the table to give them his own loaf of bread then getting up a second time to wait on them with wine. It is apparently something none of his companions did. Despite that he was their king, lord and master, Jesus took it on himself to assume the role of their servant by performing a task usually left to household slaves. Among men who were not his superiors, they were not even his peers, but merely his followers, Jesus' act of serving them was in flagrant violation of the master-disciple relationship. It marked a role reversal that broke proper standards of convention the Jews held to be sacrosanct. And this was true even for the lowliest rabbi. For him to serve his followers would have been a role reversal that would have been frowned upon. But this was no mere rabbi we're talking about. This man was accepted by his uh, apostles and disciples as the Messiah himself. To the disciples in the upper room, Jesus' behavior was actually beneath his dignity as it demeaned his station and authority. But Jesus, knowing this as he did, he did it anyway, deliberately, purposefully, 
willingly and also cordially, I imagine, trusting that his actions would leave a strong impression of the meek, humble, self-effacing spirit he was calling the disciples to imitate. As he went on to explain to them, his ministration shows in practical fashion what he said at Luke chapter 22, verse 27, I am among you as one who serves. His action exemplifies what he said at verse 26, let he among you who is greatest be as he who is least and the leader as the server. And herein lies the reason Jesus equated the bread and wine with his body and blood. Because serving food and drink to his apostles was not only about commensality. Excuse me a minute. Computer's jumping around a bit. So herein lies the reason Jesus equated the bread and wine with his body and blood. Because serving food and drink to his apostles was not only about commensality or table fellowship, it was an emphatic reminder by way of example of the attitude and behavior that he brought to every interaction with people. Jesus used a typical meal for his reminder as it was the gathering that was most exemplary of the radical, humble, gracious servant spirit role he always performed in all his fellowship with people. I don't need to elaborate upon that. We've discussed that, um, that Jesus made this his established habit throughout his ministry. And he drew upon the most representative constituents of typical meals, the bread and wine, to make his lesson memorable on a daily basis. Humble servitude was a constant characteristic of Jesus, and this was but the outward manifestation of an inner spiritual life he led every moment of every day, an inner life fully occupied with an unrelenting tug-of-war between serving himself or serving his God and his fellow man. He was continually engaged in a contest between either submitting to God's will and the leading of the Holy Spirit, or giving in, or even caving in to the contrary will prompted by his own human nature. Jesus' body constituted as it was of exactly the same flesh with the same propensity to commit sin that all people share, is where his contest with sin took place. Jesus' blood, meanwhile, like the blood of all flesh, carried within it the God-given breath of life, the reason why, in biblical parlance, life is in the blood and why shedding of blood illustrates the relinquishing of life. When Jesus made mention of his body and blood at the supper, it was with regard to his contest against sin in the flesh and the surrendering, the voluntary relinquishing of his life to God, these being the essence of his inner spiritual life, which manifested in selfless service constantly rendered to God and man, and which he had just now demonstrated around the supper table. Thus, Jesus chose a fellowship meal to illustrate basic yet essential principles of spiritual service, and he employed the staple food and drink at that meal to signify the inner spiritual life that guided and motivated his service. By telling them, this is my body, he meant that the bread signified his sinful flesh, constantly being brought into subjection so as to serve God and man instead of himself. By saying, this is my blood, he meant the wine and the wine cup signified his life, that he was continually expending or giving up for the sake of total service to God and man rather than for himself. Bread and wine being such principal constituents of their daily natural lives, Jesus could not have chosen for his disciples clearer, more significant metaphors for the essentials of their daily spiritual lives. Both the life he led, he himself personally, and the life each of his followers must aspire to lead. Jesus said that the bread is his body which is given for you, and that the cup or wine is his blood which is poured out for many. Indeed, he also said, the blood is that of the new covenant for the remission of sins. All these phrases relate to blood sacrifice, without which there can be no remission of sins. So in these remarks, Jesus was unquestionably making allusion to his imminent crucifixion, 
when the Mosaic Covenant with its animal sacrifices would be superseded forever by the greater covenant ratified through the sacrifice and death of Jesus himself. Then the significance he attributed to the bread and wine would be fully and finally realized. Nonetheless, by using the present tense during the Last Supper to say that the bread is my body, which is given for you, and that the cup is my blood, which is poured out, Jesus indicated that his mortifying of the flesh and the giving up of his life were both being accomplished even as he spoke, then and there, around a table in the upper room. His crucifixion the next day was Jesus' consummate expression of faithful obedience to God's will, when a lifetime of surrender to God and war with sin were to reach their culmination. At that moment, Jesus gave up his last breath of life, sin in his flesh was totally vanquished, and he became the ultimate, perfect, once-for-all sacrifice for sins, concluding, concluding some three and a half decades already fully devoted to sacrificial life. Nonetheless, he was describing in the bread and wine what he had lived out for all those years of his life. Now, whether his companions at the supper table the evening before his crucifixion whether they could comprehend any of this at the time is doubtful, but with hindsight and the greater insight quickened by the Holy Spirit, they would come to understand these things much more keenly. The fellowship meal Christ appointed or instituted in remembrance of him is sometimes called a memorial or a commemoration. There are many ways a leader might wish to be memorialized or commemorated, and equally as many ways that his followers might choose to do so perhaps an annual celebration of his birth, or a day of mourning on the anniversary of his death, perhaps a shrine built over his birthplace, or a mausoleum or cenotaph for his burial site, perhaps a candlelit vigil at the place he died, maybe artistic representations of the great leader, or a museum for relics associated with his life, or possibly a pilgrimage to the significant sites he went to. In fact, all these innovations and improvisations have been employed by different religious and political communities throughout history and, of course, were adopted by Christianity to some degree or other. Jesus, on the other hand, simply asked his followers to remember him by doing as he had done and what family, friends, colleagues and comrades of every society regularly do which is to gather together around food and drink, agreeable conversation, and shared activities. When Jesus gave the disciples this instruction, they were oblivious to his imminent trial and torture and death, which would um, follow the next day. Thus far, all that they remember of Jesus while in the upper room are his words and deeds and personality from the previous three and a half years that they had known him. Yet Jesus was instructing them to remember him. And how would they remember him? By which I mean, what about him would they remember? What they would remember at this supper is the Jesus that they have known uh, for those several years up till now. For any custom or practice to be a true reminder of someone, it must be truly reminiscent of that person. The word remembrance, which Jesus used at the Last Supper, means in Greek to remind or to recollect, or to recall to mind. So the table fellowship Jesus commanded his disciples to practice was required to be a reminder of him by being reminiscent of him, being, in other words, redolent of him. To that end, the fellowship meals Christians gathered at in New Testament times could be expected to jog the memories of those who had known Jesus in the days of his flesh. For other Christians who never knew Jesus in person, the table fellowship was an opportunity to learn about him from older disciples who had known him. Certainly this happened through the word ministry at those gatherings, but much of the learning about Jesus must also have come from the behavior and demeanor of others, other disciples who sought to imitate him as he had asked them to at uh, gatherings to which they uh, came. The fellowship meal practices of the original church are mentioned in the New Testament under a variety of names, titles, and descriptions. And you've got to laugh. I thought I was going to be able to cover all those names, titles, and descriptions this evening, but no chance. A complete list 
could easily include 20 words and phrases or more, depending on where we choose to draw the line. Not every reference to all these names, titles and descriptions is directly connected to or has a direct bearing on food and fellowship, let alone formal New Testament church meetings. It actually depends on context. For example, New Testament references to hospitality, receiving or lodging of visitors and reclining at table often indicate or imply food, meals and dining, but not invariably. Thus, Mark 14, verse 18, describes Christ and the apostles reclining at the Last Supper and states that they were eating, whereas Mark 16, verse 14, says the apostles were reclining, but he does not say they were eating. Many English Bible translators probably assumed that the word reclined meant that they were, in fact, eating, and so they worded the verse accordingly. But such assumptions and interpretations sometimes can obscure what the original inspired writers meant to convey. Although many passages about food or meals do not appear to relate directly to New Testament church meetings, this can sometimes be more a reflection of the reader's own perspective or preconception. Be that as it may, the same passages that seem to have no connection to church meetings will, for all that, have some application to them and perhaps more relevance than on first appearance. For example, when at Acts chapter 10, Simon Peter was awaiting a midday meal with his brethren or stayed with the household of Cornelius and ate with them, these occasions are viewed differently to formal church meetings, even though the Spirit of the Lord was present at both. And I would ask, why should they be regarded any different as a formal church meeting? Thus, when Simon Peter and other Christian Jews later withdrew and kept aloof from eating with Gentile brethren, and then Paul rebuked them for hypocrisy at Galatians 2, many commentators try to restrict the eating here to social gatherings, worldly or mundane gatherings quite separate from actual church meetings. And yet there seems to be no good reason for believing the separation uh, between Peter and the other Jewish Christians from the Gentile Christians did not affect the table fellowship in the church that Simon Peter attended. You will recall that at the commencement of the Last Supper, Jesus described the meal as this Passover at Luke 22 verse 15. Some years later, the Apostle Paul called Jesus himself Christ our Passover. That's at 1 Corinthians 5, verse 7. Christ our Passover, who has been sacrificed as the antitype of the Jews' Passover. Christ was predestined from the beginning to be the one true sacrifice for sin. So all the other sacrifices which God instituted prior to Christ's death are seen for what they really were. Types or, sa or shadows or representations that prefigured the one true sacrifice. This is true of the Jews' Passover. Neither the lambs, nor the meal, nor the deliverance from Egypt, nor the laws Moses gave Israel in connection with that event were ever the true Passover. They could only point forward to the true, which is Christ himself. He is, as John the Baptist declared, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And on this premise, the Apostle Paul refers to fellowship among Christians as a feast. The implication being that for Christians, there is a feast to be had with Christ, not only personally, but also communally or as a congregation, which is associated with Christ, our Passover. As we've seen, both at the Last Supper and at Pentecost, a term sometimes used for a fellowship meal is breaking of bread. Although there is scant evidence... Some scholars believe that prior to New Testament times, the term break bread was already a fairly universal synonym for sharing a meal and may have been a common enough term in Jewish and Greek writings that to the first readers of the New Testament, it needed no introduction or explanation. Be that as it may, New Testament writers were surely inspired to use the term based on Old Testament usage, where break bread has the distinct meaning of dividing and distributing. At Isaiah 58 verse 7, is it not to divide your bread for the hungry? At Lamentations 4 verse 4, the little children ask for bread, but no one breaks it for them. At Jeremiah 16 verse 7, 
Neither will men break bread to comfort anyone for the dead. Using the same word in Chaldean, Babylon's king Belshazzar was told at Daniel 5 verse 28, your kingdom is divided and given to the Medes and Persians. And this depicts God as a dinner host, breaking the Babylonian kingdom like bread to apportion it to his ravenous guests, the Medes and Persians. So a significant attribute implied by breaking bread seems to be the role of host or caregiver portioning out one's own food to other people. What is most pertinent and instructive in the term breaking bread? Excuse me again. So what is most pertinent and instructive in the term breaking bread is the act of giving, sharing, dividing, or as we might say, dealing or divvying out the bread. Occasionally a Christian may be separated or isolated from other believers for one reason or another, so chooses to have bread and wine alone, and will refer to this act also as breaking bread. But it is not the proper New Testament usage of the term. Anyone can tear into a loaf or cake and eat it by themselves, but the term break bread as applied to New Testament disciples tells us their practice was to share their food, not to eat in seclusion or solitude. Thus the references to breaking bread at Acts 2 are in the context of the gathering, contact and participation together of the early Christians. At verse 42, we read that they persevered in the teaching and fellowship of the apostles in breaking of bread and prayers. The ancient Western text of the Greek New Testament perhaps gives breaking of bread its strongest connection to fellowship by describing it in verse 42 as the fellowship of breaking of bread. Many Bible scholars say that in New Testament times, breaking of bread was a traditional title for the evening meal in Jewish homes. And while the archaeological evidence is not as clear or definitive as it might be, passages in the Jewish Talmud appear to uphold this basic idea. Jews of today speak of breaking bread with one another when sharing a meal. So in his commentary on the book of Acts and the Epistles, Alfred Norris points out that the term break bread is not necessarily a technical one in the sense of Christian communion, stating that, Perhaps in the earliest ages of the church, a distinction between breaking bread at a meeting and breaking bread and taking a meal would have seemed artificial. I could add here that if the term breaking bread did already apply to meals in Jewish households, there is nothing in the New Testament to suggest that they differed notably from the breaking of bread by the Christian Jews in Acts chapter 2. On the contrary, in fact, Luke chapter 24, verse 30 and verse 35 record that the risen Lord broke bread with a Jewish family in Emmaus at what presumably was a meal typical of those being shared that late afternoon in devout Jewish households throughout the land. This by itself implies some correlation or equivalence between Jewish meals and breaking of bread, especially so if the two men of Emmaus who ran back to the disciples in Jerusalem and used the term breaking of bread to, to describe the meal, as verse 35 suggests. The particular day Jesus was invited to stay overnight in Emmaus was midway through the Feast of Unleavened Bread, which still had half a week left to run. And because leaven was forbidden in Jewish houses during the feast, the bread served at the table in that Emmaus house must have been matzah, or unleavened bread. So we can imagine the people's wonderment that Jesus, having taken the loaf and then blessed it and broken it, then gave into their hands what was common leavened bread, as Luke's Greek word artos indicates. This is not to make distinctions without a difference. Luke was apparently careful to deliberately differentiate the Jews' more usual leavened bread from the unleavened kind. Firstly, at Luke chapter 22, verse 1 and 7, to make a contrast with the ordinary bread Jesus broke at the Last Supper. Next, at Acts 12, verse 3, where unleavened is a synonym for Passover at verse 4, uh, Mark 14, verses 1 through 12 also shows this point. And lastly, at Acts chapter 20, verse 6 and verse 7, which, 
after referring to the days of unleavened bread on one hand, meaning the week of the Jewish Passover, Luke next mentions a Christian meeting to break artos, that is ordinary, normal, leavened bread. This passage is incidental evidence that New Testament disciples broke whatever bread was readily available. And I assure you that over, over many, many centuries, there's been great debates about what sort of bread um, um, Christians should, should break. In any, any case, it seems that wherever breaking of bread passages in the New Testament provide enough detail, they describe what most of us would agree is a meal, and quite a hearty meal at that. Specifically, at the feeding of the 5,000, when the unanimous report of all four Gospels is that all who ate were filled. That's at Matthew 14, verse 20, Mark 6, verse 42, Luke 9, verse 17, and John 6, verse 26. Then there was the feeding of the 4,000, when Jesus wished for his followers to eat enough that they not faint on the long journey back to their homes. They had been with Jesus for three days as they'd been traveling, so they might have had more than a day's journey to get back to their homes. Uh, that's recorded at Matthew 15, verse 37, and Mark 8, verse 8. Much later, at Acts 27, verses 33 to 44, after everyone aboard the ship in the storm had fasted for two weeks, Paul then broke bread with the crew and the passengers, and everyone ate sufficient bread to renew their strength for the hazardous swim to shore. Now, as far as I can tell, no New Testament passage gives a different picture of breaking bread than as some kind of a basic common meal. If the term breaking bread always means a meal in the New Testament, it lines up with the earlier remarks connecting breaking bread with the evening meals in Jewish homes of that era, as those evening meals were typically the main meal of the day. So perhaps, Acts chapter 2 verse 46 can be understood to mean meal gatherings of that kind where it says concerning the Christian disciples that breaking bread in the house they did eat their food with gladness. In the house there is literally from house to house and must refer to people's own homes rather than the temple referred to earlier in the same verse. Now the portion I cited says the disciples broke bread and ate their food. And many commentators assert that Luke carefully differentiated between the breaking of bread on one hand and the eating of food on the other. But the fact that these refer to one practice, not two discrete practices, is much clearer if the word eat is properly translated as to participate or to accept. Bullinger translates it as to take a share or a part of anything with others. And thus, the Derby Bible says, breaking bread in the house, they received their food. The New American Standard Version says, breaking bread from house to house, they were taking their food together. And Young's literal translation says, breaking bread at every house, they were partaking of food. Now these more accurate translations describe disciples both receiving or taking or partaking of food as the direct outcome of and in full correlation with breaking bread. And so these renderings of verse 46 show that Luke was not referring to two distinct kinds of meal event, but was plainly describing one and the same kind of meal event where everyone firstly broke bread by giving their various contributions of food plus drink presumably, and then everyone partook of that food contributed by one another. Here was mutual give and take between the partakers, the reciprocal offering and then receiving of food and drink as each person did his or her part to observe Christ's command to do this, in essentially the same way as he did for his companions at the Last Supper. Actually, Luke chapter 2 verse 46, while it's succinct, and as John said this evening, it's cram-packed, full of details, but while it's succinct on this point, it is perhaps also the clearest description of Christians putting Christ's command into practice. Here in this passage, food means nourishment. It certainly refers to the bread, 
but also to anything else served with it. For as we noted many times in this series, bread in biblical times was so basic and essential a food and so fun fundamental to a meal that the word bread itself was synonymous with all food and every meal. Yet it was not customary to eat bread by itself, but in combination with a wide variety of other solid or liquid foods, as was apparent at the Last Supper. At John 21 verse 6, Jesus asked the fishermen on the boat if they had anything to eat. The Greek word used there literally means eaten in addition to, and it referred specifically to anything eaten with bread, which indicates that use of condiments with bread was such a customary, normal, commonplace practice that they even had a word for it in common parlance. And this helps resolve the query posed by some commentators that the concept of mutual exchange of food at the breaking of bread seems futile or superfluous or unnecessary because everyone would have ended up getting back just the exact same food they had handed out. That certainly would have been true if everyone made exactly identical contributions, but more likely there was most often considerable variety. Much, if not all, of the bread was homemade, so each loaf will have been slightly different from the others in terms of its ingredients, its preparations and method of cooking, and in terms of the condiments provided with it, which could be anything from meat and fish to vinegar and wine and all the other types of condiments between them. And whereas there was not in biblical times the almost limitless variety of breads that we have available today, there was still great diversity as the um, archaeology out of Mesopotamia and Egypt prove. Even in Judea there was great diversity which had long been uh, exposed to the culinary arts of surrounding nations and also exposed by importing, imports uh, to the grains, the cereals, the fruits and vegetables introduced from distant lands. So there's no need to think that uh, Jewish meals were necessarily uh, Spartan. Another word prominently used for Christian fellowship meals is a Greek noun, uh, dipnon, often translated supper in our English Bibles. Its first recorded use was by Paul at 1 Corinthians 11 verse 20 in his remark about eating what he calls the Lord's Supper, which in many churches is the preferred label for Holy Communion or breaking of bread, and out of which arose the term Last Supper that Christians often use for Christ's meal on the night of his betrayal. Dipnon appears 16 times in the New Testament, while its related verb dipneo, meaning to sup, appears four times. Now, the ancient origin of the word dipnon is not certain, but is thought to relate to an Indo-European root word uh, pronounced something like die or de, meaning to share or divide. If so, then dipnon originally conveyed much the same idea as breaking of bread, indicating that it referred to a communal meal, the meal shared by a gathering of people such as a family or friends or other associates. One Christian writer has this to say, Evidently the Greek breakfast was a meal where all that was eaten was a little bread dipped in wine. The midday meal was eaten anywhere, even on the street or in a city square. But the dipnon was the main meal of the day, where men, women and children sat down with no sense of hurry, and where they not only satisfied their hunger, but lingered long in each other's company, enjoying fellowship. Whatever names, titles and descriptions of food and eating appear in the New Testament, they all harmonize with the fact that the table fellowship Jesus instituted for his remembrance and its later practice as recorded in the New Testament took the familiar form of a gathering around a common meal. As one Christian writer has stated, it is generally accepted that communion was a fellowship meal as was the Jewish Passover at which Jesus originally instituted the ritual. And in his book, The First Century Ecclesia, J.B. Norris says, the breaking of bread was associated with the common evening meal. That is, it was involved with a social meal in much the same way that Jesus and his apostles partook of it at the Passover meal. At 1 Corinthians 11, Paul raised the subject of the Lord's Supper because of the divisions and factions that appeared whenever it was being observed by the church in Corinth. 
due to the schisms among the Christians at Corinth, Paul had to tell them at verse 20 that when you meet together, it is not to eat the Lord's Supper. And by that he meant that because their conduct was so unlike the Lord himself, their gatherings were not worthy of the name Lord's Supper. The unchristlike conduct he was referring to is detailed in verses 21 through 22. Firstly, he says that each takes his own supper first before the others, meaning that each person or each household starts consuming their own food and drink without first offering it to others. Secondly, Paul says, one goes hungry while another gets drunk, meaning there were those brothers and sisters who brought plenty and would eat and drink to excess, whereas there were others who had little or nothing to eat or drink and were just left to go without. Thirdly, Paul exclaimed to those who were rich enough to have their own homes to gorge and get drunk in that they were shaming those who had nothing and they were thus despising the whole church of God. It seems that those who had plenty to eat and drink were flaunting the fact, maybe even boasting about it, without any consideration for how demeaning or humiliating this may have been to the poor and needy at the gathering. This certainly showed the low regard or contempt they had for many of their brethren in Christ within their own congregation. But as Paul intimated, it may be also betrayed the fact that they despised God's church in its entirety. Paul asks at verse 22, What shall I say to you? Shall I praise you? In this I do not praise. Now James 2 indicates that some Christians showed favoritism toward wealthy brethren. And so it may have been that among the Corinthian Christians, wealthier brethren were used to receiving praise of men, especially if, as many Christians believe today, wealth is seen as proof of God's favour. My 1983 revised edition of the Lion Handbook of the Bible gives this brief synopsis of 1 Corinthians 11, verses 17 through 34. It says, In the early days, the Lord's Supper took place in the course of a communal meal. All brought what food they could, and it was shared together. Not so in Corinth. There they could not even wait for everyone to arrive before they began eating. And some went drunk while others went hungry. It is not surprising that Paul could not commend them. It was a disgrace. He pulls them up short with a reminder of the circumstances in which the first Lord's Supper took place. Their offence is serious. At 1 Corinthians 11 verse 27, Paul states that whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner shall be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. The word guilty here means liable or subject or bound to a legal or contractual obligation. It is one reason Paul at verse 25 cites Jesus' words from the Last Supper to stress the binding covenant relationship that Christians are under obligation to, are under obligation to keep. Under the terms of Jesus' command to eat and drink in remembrance of him, those who eat and drink in an unworthy manner will be judged against the principles which the body and blood, and by extension the bread and wine, signify. The unworthy manner of eating and drinking is what Paul described in verses 17 through 22. Gathering together, not for better, but for worse, divisively, schismatically, in various factions, rather than as a united brotherhood. Regards eating in an unworthy manner, the Lion Handbook cuts to the chase by saying, no Christian is ever worthy to come into God's presence, but that is not the point here. Judgment has overtaken the Corinthians, not for insufficient self-examination, but for stuffing themselves at the meal as if it had no connection with the Lord's death. At verse 28, Paul says, Let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of the bread and drink of the cup. This is not referring to quite the same self-examination as at uh, 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 13, verse 5. Both are necessary, of course, but in Paul's context at 1 Corinthians 11, he actually means for the brethren to prove themselves, put themselves to the test by doing at the Lord's Supper what they have, been, what they have to do to show one another and to show Paul, not to mention the Lord himself, that they can treat each other the way Christ treated his disciples at the Last Supper. For, as Paul goes on to warn at verse 29, 
He who eats and drinks, eats and drinks judgment to himself if he does not discern the body rightly. Here judgment refers to condemnation and punishment which is proved by verses 30 through 31, where Paul remarks on the failing health of many Corinthian church members and the deaths of several of them. These were severe judgments already being sent from God on Corinthian Christians for their unchristlike attitudes and unchristlike un actions toward their fellow members. Their unchristian behavior, the divisiveness, the selfishness, the arrogance, the contempt, all happened because of brethren failing or refusing to recognize every brother and sister as equal members of Christ's church, which in this context is Christ's body, the body that Paul meant when he criticized the Corinthians for not discerning the body. Discerning Christ's body is to be sufficiently discriminating as to distinguish Christ's people and their gatherings and activities from those people of the world with its pride, selfishness, and godlessness. Discerning the body is also to recognize and acknowledge everyone who make up Christ's body in all their diversity and with all their differences. And this has to be shown by every member, treating every other member as Christ would treat them. This does not depend on liking everyone or agreeing with everyone or being blind to their possible flaws and offenses. It depends on accepting that Christ invited and welcomed them and that he expects them to be received and treated hospitably by all his other members. Brothers and sisters who ate and drank in a way that excluded some brethren from their company contradicted and violated the very reason Jesus instituted table fellowship for his remembrance. It was meant to be reminiscent of him, redolent of his attitude, of his disposition and his behavior toward others, exactly what the Corinthian brethren failed to let it be. These selfish Corinthian Christians compromised not only their own witness to Christ, but also that of the congregation as a whole. And Paul was not diffident or vague about telling them what they needed to do. At verse 33, he says, So, my brethren, when each of you come together to eat, Wait for one another, or as the emphatic diaglot says, cordially receive from each other. Now on the premise that they wait for and receive from one another at the Lord's Supper, Paul is happy to call them my brethren, to stress their shared acknowledgement, their shared recognition of each member of the body. But Paul's next instruction in verse 34 is much more ominous. It conveys a threat or warning. He says, If anyone is hungry, let him eat at home, so that you may not come together for judgment. This command was to those who are hungry, which is to say the voracious wine-bibber sort, whom Paul mentioned at verse 21, and who, who he addressed at verse 22, when he said, Have you not each got houses to eat and drink in? Or do you despise the assembly of God and will put to shame them who have nothing? So when he, when he says in verse 34, if anyone is hungry, uh, th this is the class of people that he's addressing that to. Now, to members of the congregation whom he saw fit to call brethren, Paul says at verse 33, Each of you, come together to eat. But to the voracious wine-bibbers, those Christians who were shaming their brethren by not acknowledging them, those Christians whose divisiveness showed real contempt for the whole church, Paul says in effect at verse 34, you may not come together, eat at home. He does not address them as brethren, not while they fail to exhibit a brotherly Christ-like spirit at the Lord's Supper, and in view of their unchristlike motives and their wrong conduct at the supper, Paul was telling them they really had no part in attending the gathering at all, but are making themselves liable to the condemnation he described in verses 29 to 30. Better it would be that they stay home with their own food and drink to gratify their cravings there than despise the church of God and shame their brethren in Christ by their presence at the Lord's Supper. Pastor Barry Hodson has presented more on the Lord's Supper in his booklet, Should Children Partake of the Communion, which can be found on the CRC website. 
We cannot tell how large or elaborate the customary New Testament fellowship meals may have been. It surely depended on the means and the motivations of individual congregations. But extravagance, excess and wastefulness would not have been in keeping with the Spirit of Christ, whose burden was to meet people's needs but not necessarily to gratify their wants. The brief account of Martha and Mary at Luke chapter 10 verses 38 through 42 is instructive as it teaches that whereas Jesus wants his followers to show generosity, he is not asking them to exceed what is needful. And table fellowship and memory of Jesus need not be overdone or exorbitant. He was welcomed into the home of his disciple Martha, and later on, while his sister Mary sat at Jesus' feet listening to his words, Martha herself was distracted by much service, or as the New American Standard Version says, she was distracted with all her preparations. She evidently did all this to serve her Lord, but it meant she was being taken further from his presence and found herself alone, struggling, and frustrated. She only drew near to the Lord when she was at an end of herself. Martha complained, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to do all the serving alone? And here it is important to notice that she says, left me, which means Mary had departed Martha during the course of work they had done earlier. Mary had already helped with the serving. The two sisters must have prepared a light meal and simple enough that it was a meal light and simple enough that it, that it was got together easily and quickly. What separated them in their service to Christ was that whereas Martha was intent on preparing and providing more, Mary had not let herself be distracted by extra tasks and extra effort that was surplus to requirements. After serving food and drink sufficient for their visitors' needs, Mary had joined them as they were eating and drinking and listening to Jesus, while Martha had quite needlessly become over busy with excessive preparations. Perhaps Martha had taken it upon herself to emulate the convivial banquet type meal uh, that Matthew Levi had provided for Jesus in his own home. But it was too much for her and not something Jesus required from her. Martha's service had become a disservice both to herself and to her Lord. Jesus already knew this was characteristic of Martha and said to her at verse 41, You are anxious and troubling yourself about so many things. Because he used a word which described the portion of food Joseph had given his brother Benjamin in Egypt at Genesis 43 verse 34, we know that Martha's preparations were for a meal. As the New American Standard Version puts it, Jesus replied, Only a few things are necessary, or only one and Mary has chosen the good portion. Jesus was very gently telling Martha, among other things, that her concept of table fellowship was mistaken, and that it misdirected her focus off the Lord himself, off the needs of the congregation, and off what was best for her spiritual relationships. Mary's priority was the best one, and was what Martha needed to imitate. To gather together around Jesus as the centre of attention with a basic common meal suitable for everyone's needs. Now coming back to the Gospel of Thomas, which we considered at the start of tonight's talk, it is written there that there occurred a great commotion while a house was being built, and Jesus stood up and went away to the place. And seeing a man lying dead, he took him by the hand and said, Man, I say to you, arise and go on with your work. And directly the man rose up and adored him. And seeing this, the crowd wondered and said, This child is from heaven, for he has saved many souls from death, and he continues to save all during his life. Earlier still, this gospel says, The infant of a certain neighbor fell sick and died, and its mother wept sore. And Jesus heard there that there was great lamentation and commotion, and he ran in haste and found the child dead and touched his breast and said, I say to you, child, be not dead, but live and be with your mother. And directly the infant looked up and laughed. And Jesus said to the woman, take the child and give it milk and remember me. And seeing this, the crowd that was standing by wondered and said, truly this child was either God or an angel of God, for every word of his is a certain fact. And Jesus went out from there playing with the other children.
In this same gospel are other accounts of miracles and healings that Jesus performed while he was still a child, supposedly. These accounts say he made muddy water crystal clean and he resurrected a dead fish. He made birds out of clay and brought them to life. He was able to carry water home in a cloth and help Joseph with his carpentry by miraculously stretching a wooden plank to the required length. In this gospel are tales of when the young Jesus angrily cursed neighborhood children and adults, mocked and scolded his tutors, and even struck some of them blind or dead. Now, if you judge these accounts to be incredible or fabulous or fanciful, then I must agree with you. And if we were to remember such a Jesus according to these writings, we would obviously not be remembering the Jesus that we have come to know. While in its broadest sense the term apocrypha came to mean any writing of dubious authority and now refers to works excluded from the accepted scripture canon, it is important to realize that New Testament apocrypha and the large body of other New Testament pseudepigrapha came from people who thought of themselves as followers of Christ. Fraudulent, mystical, and absurd they may be, but for a time the church accepted and valued them. Even if those who composed the apocryphal New Testament had tried imitating the stamp of authority in our four divinely inspired New Testament Gospels, diligent readers have little trouble seeing how fake versions differ or discerning the probable motives of their authors. For example, in what I read from the Gospel of Thomas, we notice the author's veneration of Mary and his belief in Christ's pre-existent deity. So it is easy to imagine people not well versed in the New Testament coming across the apocryphal Gospels and getting a distorted impression of Jesus' ministry and teaching plus an erroneous concept of his nature and personality. That is, a different Jesus, in other words. So in apocryphal Christian writings, we find examples of what the New Testament refers to as another Gospel and a false Christ. The sort of deceptions of which Christ and the New Testament writers warned Christians to beware and which were beginning to emerge in the latter part of the New Testament era and would prove to have a major effect on the emerging church after the end of the New Testament era. Now, it is generally accepted today by Christian scholars from a wide cross-section of denominations that in New Testament times, Christ's memorial was a meal. And it is almost universally acknowledged by church historians and theologians that the memorial which emerged in later Christianity is different to that which was practiced by New Testament Christians. And yet, the common or popular view uh, persists that Jesus' memorial uh, was an instituted to be a simple ritual. And so, God willing, next time I speak, in what will be the last episode in this series on food and fellowship for the foreseeable future anyway, we will consider the history of the changes made to Christ's memorial in the church after the New Testament era uh, up to our day, perhaps.